Well, welcome back to the Bio 180 Lecture Series. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of cell metabolism. And so we've gotten through most of our units. We're now at the very end. Today we're going to be discussing light reactions. And then our last lecture of the series will be on the Calvin cycle. And both of these topics are really discussing the larger topic of photosynthesis which we are using as an example of an anabolic pathway in metabolism. Okay, So today as we go through this, I'm going to first start by reviewing a couple things related to photosynthesis that we've already learned. Then I'm going to overview the process of photosynthesis itself, talk about some photosystems and what they are, and then we'll go over the light reactions and finally the Z-scheme. So the first thing I want to review is one of the first lessons that we discussed was that of absorption. And in photosynthesis, that is going to be, be that is going to be an important concept for us. So remember absorption, we would have a, an atom, and so we'd have a nucleus. Here, and then we would have around, we drew some dotted lines. And those dotted lines represented the energy shells where the electrons resided. And so here we have the nucleus. And we said we could have an electron here at an interior shell. So this would be an electron, and that we could have an incoming wave of light. So here's an incoming wave of light, and that that incoming wave of light, so this is light, that that incoming wave of light could be absorbed by this electron and cause it to jump up to what we called an excited state. We have an excited state. And then that electron, and that was referred to as absorption. And that's the light wave absorbing that electron. And so you have excitation. Is this arrow right here? Excitation. And then that electron would usually fairly quickly return back to this earlier shell, and we call that its ground state. But that when it fell down, that process is known as relaxation. So it took energy to get up to this higher shell, and when it fell back down, that energy, we learned, that energy can't be created or destroyed, only transformed. So as it falls back down, that energy wasn't lost. It had to go somewhere. And there's kind of two things that can happen. We learned previously that as relaxation occurs, we get the emission or fluorescence. Of an outgoing light wave. This is also called emission. And so we would have an outgoing light wave. And we also learned that a lot of times this incoming light wave has more energy in it than the outgoing light wave because we're going to lose some of this as just heat and vibration. And we learned that in the second law a couple weeks ago, right? So we usually have a little bit uh, different color of emission wavelength or light than we have of the incoming light wave. And so we learned that about absorption. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to see this process take place in photosynthesis with one important exception. We said that this electron would just relax down and we would emit another wavelength of light. But in some cases, as we move this electron out to an outer shell farther away from the nucleus, and remember this is an excited state, so it's an energized electron. And the other thing that can happen 
is we can take some kind of other molecule. So we can have some kind of cofactor here. Remember, cofactors are things that are able to transfer electrons that will come along. And instead of allowing this electron to relax, it's kind of in this excited state. It's kind of a vulnerable to what we call, put it over here, electron capture. And so that excited electron can actually be adopted by some kind of cofactor in a process known as electron capture. And we're going to see that take place in photosynthesis as well. So that's something that we need to know to understand today's lecture. The other thing that we want to go over has to do with chloroplasts. So we covered this in unit three on cell structures. But chloroplasts, so let's review that real quickly. And the parts of a chloroplast. So the chloroplast is an organelle. It has three membranes in it. So we'll draw three. This membrane right here is known as the outer membrane. This membrane right here is known as the inner membrane. And this area between the two is known as the intermembrane space. And there is some things, but not a lot of activity that goes on on those membranes or spaces. But inside this area right here, this is where a lot is going to happen. So this area we call the stroma. And then within the stroma, there is another membrane that organizes itself kind of in these stacks. It's, it's pretty highly uh, convoluted. And this is called the thylakoid membrane. And inside the thylakoid membrane, this space in here is then referred to as the thylakoid space. Now, with a name like the thylakoid membrane or the thylakoid space, you might be wondering, well, what's, what's a thylakoid? Is that something? And the answer is yes. A thylakoid, one of these stacks right here, that's known as a thylakoid. And then the whole set of stacks is known as Singular is granum, but there's often several, so you'll have what's called grana. So there might be several of these thylakoid stacks inside of the stroma. Now, a couple of things that are relevant for our discussion today. We are going to be talking about a series of proteins that are embedded here in this thylakoid membrane. And those are referred to as photosystems. And those photosystems are going to be the main players in what we call the light reactions of photosynthesis. So again, that's going to be on the thylakoid membrane. Later on, we're going to be in the stroma. And so our next lecture is going to be on a process called the Calvin cycle that takes place in the stroma. And so that's going to be present here in the stroma. But right now, today, we're going to be focusing on this membrane right here, the thylakoid membrane, and the photosystems that are embedded in that membrane. So with that introduction and kind of the locations and the chloroplast inside the cell, let's come over here and let's look about what we're going to be talking about today. So previously, we learned about cell respiration. And we said that cell respiration was where we were going to take a molecule like glucose, C6H12O6, and we were going to use oxygen 
in order to create CO2 and water. And then the idea was that we were going to create a lot of energy in that process. And we were going to specifically use that energy then to make ATP for our cell. Now, glycolysis, or uh, sorry, photosynthesis is interesting that we're going to take this cell respiration reaction, and for photosynthesis, we are actually going to take six carbon dioxides, six waters, and we're going to convert them into one glucose, and six oxygen. And so photosynthesis is just going to be cell respiration in reverse. Now, a couple of caveats. Up here, cell respiration was producing energy. That means when we run this reaction in reverse, we are going to need energy. We're going to require energy coming in for this process to work. And this is where we're going to have, where are we going to get that energy from? It's going to be coming from sunlight. So somehow we've got to use light energy and harvest that light energy to somehow turn it into chemical energy that's stored in the bonds of glucose. And then that glucose can actually be used to create ATP in the mitochondria like we've learned previously. And so this is the process that we have to figure out and understand at least a little bit by the end of the day. So how does this photosynthesis work? We're going to divide photosynthesis up into, well, one more step maybe we'll talk about coming back over here. As we learned earlier in cell respiration, photosynthesis is going to be an oxidation reduction reaction. And so over here, we're going to take our CO2. It's in its most oxidized state. And so this is a series of reduction reactions. And then our water, we're going to actually create more bonds with oxygen, get rid of the hydrogen. And so this is going to be our overall oxidation reaction. And we'll see a little bit about where those take place. The oxidation reaction, we actually split these up between different uh, areas of the cell. Oxidation, this is what we're going to talk about today. So this is the photosystems and light reactions. And then the overall reduction, this is what's going to happen in the Calvin cycle. And so let's talk a little bit about what's happening here. This is where we're going to use the sunlight. So sunlight or light is going to come into the light reactions. And then we're also going to have some inputs. We're going to have a molecule called NADP plus come into the light reactions. And we're also going to have ADP and inorganic phosphate come into the light reactions. And then coming out of the light reactions, we're going to have what's called NADPH. And we're going to have ATP. And these are going to be our two primary products of the light reactions. This is what the light reactions are trying to make. And the light reactions are trying to make those so that they can participate in the Calvin cycle. 
And so the Calvin cycle, this is that process that's in the stroma. The light reactions, remember, these are actually on the thylakoid membrane. And so ATP is actually going to go into the Calvin cycle, and so is the NADPH. We're going to use these as forms of energy. And then as they get used, they're going to come back. So we kind of get this cycle between the light reaction and the Calvin cycle of NADPH and ATP being used in the Calvin cycle, and then their byproducts being sent back over to light reactions to be regenerated. Now, in this, as that cycle is taking place, it's the Calvin cycle where we're going to take our carbon dioxide right here and feed that into the carbon cycle. And then we're going to get off a molecule called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate you're actually already familiar with from our discussion on glycolysis. This is one of the intermediates in glycolysis, and that intermediate is what's used by several steps in the cytosol to make our glucose. All right. Another input over here is we are going to input into this process over here in the light reactions, we're going to take water and we're going to input it through the light reactions to pull out, or eventually I guess we need two waters right there, and then we're going to pull out our oxygen. And so that's going to be an overall overview of photosynthesis. It really has these two processes that are taking place. The light reactions, that's where we're taking water and converting it into oxygen. We're taking those electrons and using them to make NADPH, and we also get some ATP in the process. Those enter into the Calvin cycle with carbon dioxide coming from the air. The regenerated ADPPI and ADP plus get cycled into light reactions, but the overall product that we're looking to make is this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is going to then eventually be made into our glucose that's our overall product in photosynthesis. So that's a little bit of overview of where we're going. Now, let's go into discussing a little bit about our main topic today. So now we're going to take this box right here, these light reactions, and dive deeper into these light reactions, what's happening in those, and what they're going to do for us in photosynthesis. Okay, so now that we're back, let's come over here and we'll, we'll review quickly. We did a, a quick review of some of the things we learned previously in the class. We did an overview of photosynthesis and the overall reaction. Now let's look at what's called a photosystem. A so photosystem is a large complex of proteins that is found, so this would be the thylakoid membrane. And the photosystem is actually a pretty big complex, and it has in its center, it has a cluster of pigments, and this is called the reaction center. And then spread throughout along the outer edge and even within, you have all of these parts of it. Just put around here. And then these are going to be what we call antenna pigments. And then the reaction center itself also contains pigments. And so let's take a second before we go into it. It's important to understand 
the idea of what a pigment is. So a pigment is a molecule that absorbs light. And so there's lots of different pigments. We, we also call them dyes when we use them in clothing manufacturing things. For example, my pants will have a brown dye in them. My tie has dyes of different colors. So these are molecules that absorb light, and they absorb different wavelengths of light. So we've learned previously that what we call light is actually just a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And light, as a quick review, has wavelengths. So light is defined by wavelength of 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Okay? And so that's the spectrum of light. That's the spectrum of the rainbow. And it turns out that at 400 nanometers, this is purple light or purple waves. And then it goes purple, blue, uh, green, yellow, orange. And then at this end, we have red light. And so remember, this 400 nanometers would be a shorter wavelength. 700 nanometers would be larger. And so remember, we said with light previously, that the shorter the wavelength, the shorter the wavelength, we call that lambda, equals more energy. And so at purple light, we have 400 nanometers. That's a shorter wavelength. So this has more energy. And over here, red light, this has less energy. And then maybe if, you, if you've looked at the electromagnetic uh, wavelength, this is a pretty small portion of it. We, our eyes, we call it light because our eyes are sensitive to those wavelengths. We can see them and pick them up. There are other electromagnetic wavelengths, like over here on this end, beyond 700 uh, nanometers, we would have what's called uh, infrared light. And then on this hand, and below 700 or 400 nanometers, we would have ultraviolet. I guess this is in purple, it's violet, but you can make that distinction. So that's a little bit about light, and that becomes important. What happens is light is going to come in, and we're actually going to get, uh, well, let's see. Let's come back here. Under pigments, the idea is that pigments absorb light. One of the primary pigments that we see in photosynthesis is a molecule called chlorophyll. Okay, so this is the primary pigment. And in fact, this is the pigment at the reaction center. So that reaction center in our photosystem is made up of actually a combination of a couple of, of several different chlorophylls. Well, chlorophyll is the most common pigment. We do have other pigments. There are things like xenophils. Um, so there are a couple of other pigments. So chlorophyll isn't the only one. Now, one more thing I want to come back to. If we look at the absorption spectra of chlorophyll. So what's an absorption spectra? An absorption spectra is a measurement of how much light is absorbed by a pigment at different wavelengths. So what they do is they say, okay, we're going to take... 400 nanometers all the way up to 700 nanometers. And we're going to try every wavelength, and we're going to see how much uh, a pigment like chlorophyll absorbs. So if you do this for chlorophyll,
what you see is it has a large, starts out pretty high, kind of a hump here, and then it goes down, and then it goes back up again. And it's actually not that high, kind of a little bit lower over here. And so what this tells us is that chlorophyll, remember over here, this is going to be our violet and our blue colors. So chlorophyll absorbs violet and blue colors. Over here, this is reaching into your uh, yellows and orange and red. This optimum is right around red, about 680. And so it's absorbing in our red colors. It's absorbing in our blue and violet colors over here. Where it doesn't absorb is right here in the middle. So there's no absorption right here. And so that means if it's not absorbing, chlorophyll is not absorbing those pigments, that means it's reflecting those pigments. And so this is why plants, uh, their leaves and stems and things, are green. Because chlorophyll, as the major pigment, doesn't absorb green, it actually reflects green. So when we look at a plant, we're seeing that green be reflected off because the blue light and the red light is being absorbed by the chlorophyll in that plant. So that's the absorption spectra of chlorophyll. Now, let's come back over here and see how this is going to apply to our photosystem. So a photosystem, this protein, this collection of proteins, this protein complex, is going to receive in the antenna pigments light. So here's purple light that's coming in. And in that pigment, we're going to have absorption. So we get an excited electron, then that electron falls back down, and it releases red light, because remember it has to be lower in energy. And that red light is picked up by the reaction center chlorophylls. Now, at the reaction center then, we're going to have an electron that gets excited, so we're going to excite an electron with that red wavelength of light. But then that electron, rather than relaxing and being emitted, we're going to have electron capture. So this is where we're going to have electron capture, is in the reaction center. And so what happens is we have all these pigments, the antenna pigments, are all picking up light and feeding it into the reaction center. So it stays very busy, taking all these wavelengths of light that are coming into it. And in this reaction center, we have a reaction center cycle that happens. So let's write up here, reaction center cycle. Now, there are two photosystems that we see in photosynthesis, or in the light reactions. One of them, the first one that we see is called PS2, or photosystem 2, and it has a reaction center called P680. And then we're going to see, kind of ironic, but the second photosystem we see is called PS1. And its reaction center is called P700. Now, the 680 and 700 are references to its optimal absorption wavelength of 680 nanometers and 700 nanometers. And that, again, tells us that it's absorbing red light that's being fed to it from the antenna pigments. So those are the names of the two reaction centers we're going to deal with. Let's look at P680 and what happens. So P680 is sitting there in that reaction center. So it's a complex of chlorophyll molecules. And as light comes in and hits it, the P680 ends up getting uh, energized because its electrons absorb that light. And so it increases in energy and becomes a state called P680 
star or an excited P680. And it's this P680, it's got its electron kind of hanging out there in one of its outer shells, just waiting to be taken, and that's exactly what happens. We are going to have a cofactor called the primary electron acceptor in some books. We're going to call it, there's a cofactor called pheophyton. And pheophyton is kind of sitting in the, in the photosystem next to that reaction center. And so the electron that got excited is actually going to jump off P680 star and be captured by pheophyton. And so that's electron capture. So we'll write that in parentheses. So P680 star just lost its excited electron. And so now it falls in energy and becomes a species that we call P680 plus. P680 then is got a positive charge because it lost its electron. To complete this cycle, we need it to become P680, just normal, so it can be excited by another photon. The P680 has to get an electron, though, in order to neutralize itself to become P680. Where does that electron come from? Ultimately, it's going to come from splitting water. So we're going to take water, and we are going to split it up. We're going to take the water, and we are going to pull off. So we'll take our water molecule. And it has, remember the water molecule looks something like this. That's the Lewis diagram of the water molecule. And so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to split off the waters, or the hydrogen atoms. So we're going to take those off, and we're going to form two protons out of it. And that's going to leave me with just an oxygen got an octet, but it actually has too many electrons. It's got a two minus charge on that once I stripped off the H pluses. So now I've got this oxygen, and I'm going to strip off two of those electrons, and I'm going to feed them into my reaction center to balance my P680. I'm going to feed these in one at a time, not two at a time, so I'll do this twice. I guess maybe we'll write it up as electron, electron. So I have to go through two cycles to pick up these two electrons. And then what I'm left with is this oxygen atom. Now notice it's missing its octet. And so we're going to have to go through this process again to get another oxygen atom up here. And so now we're going to form a double bond, and that's going to be how we form our O2. It's going to be kind of from these reaction centers. But what I want you to focus on is this pattern that comes through, this cycle that we have to go through of the reaction center. The P680 gets excited by a photon of light, gets energized. The electron from the energized version gets captured. It falls down to a cationic state grabs an electron from water, and then returns. And this cycle, the P680 cycle, goes over and over and over again, constantly being fed by different photons of sunlight coming into it. This, then, is where the energy is going to happen. Sunlight is converting into energized electrons that are being captured by pheophyton. And so these energy, the pheophyton now, is at this elevated energy state. And we're going to see how that's going to set up an electron transport chain for us, and we'll be able to get energy out of it. But this P680 or P700, the reaction center cycle that takes place, it's not an understatement to say this is why life exists on this planet. Because sun is able to be captured and converted ultimately into ATP and then ultimately into glucose as chemical energy. That's what happens in the plants. That's where they're going to get their chemical energy from. 
They're going to use that glucose for their metabolism. And then other things like herbivores are going to eat those plants, and that's where they're going to get their energy from, is from the glucose that those plants have stored through photosynthesis. So if you're a cow, you're going to eat that grass. That's where you get energy from. If you're a lion or a human, you're going to eat that cow, and that's how you get energy from it. And so this is really a critical process. Uh, so photosynthesis is creating the energy that drives most of the life on the planet. So with that introduction of these photosystems and their parts, let's look at the whole process and see how this plays out to create the light reactions. So the light reactions themselves are going to be very analogous to something that we've already learned, which is the electron transport chain. In fact, when I draw it up on the board, I kind of start the same way that I start drawing the electron transport chain that we did for you in our last video. So I am going to start by drawing three rectangles. And those are going to be embedded in a membrane. So remember, this is the thylakoid membrane. And this space up here, we are going to make our, that's going to be the stroma. And then inside, this is going to be the thylakoid space. Now, as before, we've got these three large protein complexes embedded in the membrane. And we are going to need a method of shuttling. We're going to electron transport, or shuttling is going to be important. So we're going to need a little shuttle between these two complexes, and that is known as plastiquinone. And then up here, we're going to have a protein-based shuttle. This is, this is often abbreviated as PQ. And then PC stands for plastocyanin. And so you can see the plastos might be easy to remember that plastoquinone, plastocyanin, those are the carriers or the shuttles between these large complexes. Now, this complex right here, this is going to be photosystem 2. This is a complex known as the cytochrome BF complex. And then over here, we have photosystem 1. Now, in the process, it might, be, it might seem kind of strange to you that we start our process with photosystem 2. A lot of students say, well, why don't we start it with photosystem 1? It's a naming thing. When they were discovering this process and first elucidating it, they actually isolated photosystem 1 first. It was called the first photosystem because it was isolated first. And then it was only later that they found out that it was actually the second photosystem in the process. But by that time, everybody was already calling it photosystem 1. Now... We do have a couple of added parts that we need to add. One of them is a fourth smaller rectangle. And this rectangle is going to be an enzyme complex called NADP plus reductase. And there is another shuttle protein. We'll draw that in blue. This one is FD. Its name is ferredoxin. And then finally, our last player. Well, there's a couple more players. So...
hopefully you guys will recognize this particular player. So here is ATP synthase. Now, ATP synthase, this is the same ATP synthase that we saw in the electron transport chain. Does the same purpose. It's going to make ATP for us. It is drawn a little bit differently. Um, I noticed that before I had the stock region down here. So this is our F0 region in the membrane. This is the F1 region or stock. And it's now in the stroma. So it, it orients, it looks like it's oriented differently. It looks like it's sticking up instead of down. And it is. But it's just to put these subunits, the alpha and beta subunits, into, into the stroma, which is where they belong and where they're going to make our ATP. One other player that we need to draw here is an attachment that we're going to put here on the side of photosystem 1. So we're going to put this attachment, and this is going to be our alternatively called the water splitting complex, which is a pretty descriptive name. Or alternatively, sometimes we see it called the manganese cluster because manganese is one of the main cofactors that sits in here. There's an ion of manganese. That's one of the main cofactors in this particular complex, and that's going to be what helps us split water. So those are the different players involved with the light reactions. So when we drew our thylakoid membrane and we drew those little proteins on it, this is what we were depicting. This is the full set of it. And this is the way this overall process works. So we have right here is the reaction center, P680. And the whole process starts when we get red light coming through, hitting that reaction center. That creates a excited version, so we get P680 uh, star, we call that. That's the excited version of it. And from P680 star, remember we get an excited electron that is dumped off onto pheophyton. Pheophyton receives or captures that electron, and it passes it on to plastoquinone. In the meantime, P680 star, when it lost that electron, became P680 plus. We're going to leave it there for just a second and come back in a moment to it. In the, in the meanwhile, or meantime, let's follow this electron. It hits plastoquinone. Plastoquinone comes over and contributes it or donates it to the cytochrome BF complex. Here, we have a series of cofactors, and that electron hops among those cofactors. As it hops among those cofactors, it is going to be a proton pump like we have seen previously. The orientation is a little bit different in that it's going to pump protons from the stroma as those electrons bounce around. It pumps it from the stroma into the thylakoid space. And it does so about one proton for every electron that goes through. So we have one electron going through, so we got one proton pumped. So we'll put proton it's pumped. So, cytochrome BF complex is a proton pump. Now, the electrons then are moving through that. After they've run through the cytochrome BF complex, they are going to hop onto plastocyanin. Plastocyanin's job, the only thing it does is it transfers them over here 
to the P700 reaction center. Well, it doesn't transfer them to P700. It actually transfers them to P700 plus. Remember that reaction cycle right here? So we've got the plus version, and that's what we're adding an electron to. So P700 plus receives an electron from plastocyanin, and it becomes P700. Then we get another photon of light that comes through. That photon of light excites the pigments, and it becomes P700 plus. And that excited electron from P700, or did I say plus? From P, it becomes excited to P700 star. And that excited electron then is again captured by the photosystem and passed on to this shuttle called ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin then passes that electron on to the NADP plus reductase. And, as its name implies, NADP reductase, or NADP plus reductase, is going to take NADP plus, comes in here, and it's going to pass on it really passes on two electrons to one NADP plus, and that creates a molecule of NADPH. And that's one of our products that we're looking to get out of this process. Now, NADP plus, you haven't seen this before, but you have seen a close cousin of NADP plus. So this is the same, essentially the same molecule as NAD plus that we saw in electron transport and the Krebs cycle. All, the only difference between NADP plus and NAD plus is the letter P. So this is a phosphate, stands for phosphate, NAD phosphate plus. And so all we're doing in this case is this has an additional phosphate on it. So it has a little bit different handle and is used by a couple different enzymes than NAD uh, plus would. But its acceptance of electrons to create NADPH is exactly the same as NAD plus becoming NADH. Now, notice in this last one, we needed two electrons to create one NADP plus. So that means we have to go back here, and we have to draw all these arrows again so that we get a second electron in here so that we can transfer two to our NADPH. And so that's what's happening. We also, in order to do that, right, we had two electrons, so we have to have two waves of light come here, and we have to have two light waves come here so that we can excite both of those electrons in each photosystem. Now, let's come back here to P680 we left it kind of in this state as P680+. Plus. Where does it get its electrons from? <coughs> Those electrons are coming from water. So we're going to take one water molecule. We're going to run it through the manganese cluster. And we're going to get a couple products out of it. One thing that we get is our two electrons that we're going to use to feed into the P680, right? So we're going to get a couple of electrons out of it. We're going to get two protons out of it. And then we're also going to get half of an oxygen molecule. Okay? Now, the, the numbers, I'm... I, half of an oxygen molecule, what's half of an oxygen molecule? Well, means we're just halfway done with creating one oxygen molecule. So, let's follow this down. When we got two, so remember we put two electrons through this, so we get two 
We're going to take two protons through it. Now, notice what we're doing is we've got some protons on here because we split water in the thylakoid space. And then we pump some protons in here. And so what we're doing is we're building up a proton gradient, just like what we saw in the electron transport chain. These protons now can come over here, and they can run through ATP synthase. So as the protons run through ATP synthase, remember we're going to get ADP and PI, and they're going to come through that complex, and they're going to make ATP for us. In fact, the four protons that we have running through this system are going to be enough to make one ATP. Okay, so that's the way the system's going to work. We put in one water molecule, got half an oxygen out of it, needed some wavelengths of light, ran the electrons through the system, and based on that, we're able to get one NADPH and one ATP out of it. And that's going to be, these two are overall products of these light reactions. The light reactions just keep running over and over again, pumping more electrons through this system, pumping more protons, and getting more and more NADPH and ATP out of it. And that's basically the light reactions and how they're working. There's one other element before we close. And this is really what's happening energetically. So this is kind of the physical space and how it works and what's happening, where the electron's going. But it's also helpful to look at an energy diagram of photosynthesis. And so a lot of times when this was first developed, uh, this is called a Z scheme. by biologists. Um, the way we draw it now, it was first drawn to look like a Z. The way we draw it now looks more like an N, but we still call it a Z scheme. So here's the way this works. We're going to do a chart. And so on this side, we're going to put kind of the free energy of some of our intermediates. And so we're going to start out here. We'll start it right here. And this bar represents the energy level. We're going to start out with P680. And so P680 at its ground state is at this energy level. And remember, we now get a photon of light that hits P680, and that energizes to create P680 star. So let's depict that by drawing it going upward to a higher bar that we will call P680 star. And now the electron right here gets captured and flows downhill to We'll call it pH, that's our pheophyton, which then flows it downhill to our plastoquinone carrier. And that flows downhill to our cytochrome. Oops. That flows downhill to our cytochrome BF complex. And then that flows downhill to our, this flows downhill to our plastocyanin. And so by the time we reach plastocyanin, we have kind of zapped out all of the energy that was gained by that photon uh, exciting that electron up there. We're now about equal, maybe even a little bit lower. So who can plastocyanin donate to? 
Well, it donates to P700 plus. Its electron gets picked up by P700 plus right here, so its energy is now right here. P700 plus rises once it receives that electron. It's now at P700, which has essentially that energy. But now the problem is to make our NADH, which is what we need to make, Here's NADP plus. And so right now my electron energy in P700 is at this level of energy. And so it doesn't have enough energy to donate electrons to NADP plus. In fact, it's lower in energy. It should go the opposite way. So what we're going to do is again add a second photon of light, and that's what kicks up up here to P700. We now have, we re-energized that electron to P700 star by absorbing another photon of light. And so now we can start to flow downhill again. So we flow downhill, it gets captured by ferrodoxin, and onto NADP plus reductase, which then passes on to NADP, and this is how we make NADPH is what comes out of that. And so this is then a map, or the Z-diagram, you can see it looks like if you were to rotate it 90 degrees, it would look like a letter Z. Actually, now, because of the way we draw it, it looks like a big letter N, okay? But that's what's happening energetically. Notice it's at these critical points right here that we're able to excite or energize those electrons so that they can start flowing downhill to create us the NADPH that we need for the Calvin cycle. Really, the whole thing is just trying to get an electron to kind of move uphill. We're trying to get an electron from here, P680, to donate to NADPH, even though it's higher in energy than P680 was. And actually, it's not really P680 that we're trying to get the electron from. Remember, the P680 star will come down here and reform as P680+. Plus. And so then we have water right here at this energy level. And we're going to flow downhill. This is really hungry for electrons. It's got a positive charge. So it has a strong enough charge to be able to accept those electrons actually from water. And so this is critical too. So really what we're trying to do is take electrons from water and energize them so we can add them to NADPH, even though NADPH sits at a higher energy level than water. And this is how we do it. We do it by exciting electrons, creating an electron vacuum capable of sucking electrons from water. So this is a pretty powerful vacuum. And then we just flow downhill, re-energize, and then flow downhill again to NADPH. And that's how life works. This is how we're able to generate glucose in plants and then use that as herbivores and carnivores to sustain life on the planet. So that's the energy diagram. Both of these are helpful. They're different views of what's going on in photosynthesis. They've got the same players, but they show them in slightly different ways. This is an energetics diagram, and this is a physical map of the process. In our next lesson, when we come back, we are going to look at this NADPH that we create and this uh, ATP that we create. And we're going to see how these get used in the Calvin cycle to generate the glucose that we need. It turns out a lot of people think, well, if your chloroplasts are making ATP, why do you need mitochondria? Why not just use this ATP? And it turns out that the ATP that are made in the chloroplast are actually used in the chloroplast. They're not used by the rest of the cell. They're going to be used in the chloroplast in order to just generate glucose.
or really glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Why do it that way? Well, because the ATP is not a very good form of storing energy. It's like trying to store energy as a loaf of bread. Bread is great, it's very edible and very useful for us to use, but it does not store very well. You leave bread out for a couple days, it goes dry, or worse yet, it goes moldy and then can't be used. And so ATP um, actually disintegrates or, or gets lost, becomes ineffective pretty quickly. So instead, what the plant wants to do is take the ATP in here and use it to create a more permanent storage for energy. It turns out that, remember, this process requires light. So what do you do during the long winters where there's not a lot of light, or during night when there's not a lot of light? You might not, your, your ATP as bread might go bad. And so you need some kind of long, easily stored form of energy, and that's what glucose is. Glucose is the cellular equivalent to wheat. Right, you can take, if you store it as wheat, wheat will last for 30, 40 years. And the same for the plant, if it can create, use ATP to make glucose, it can store that glucose over winters, over nights, over years, when it can't carry out this process of photosynthesis. So that's what's gonna happen. So we'll see the second part of the Calvin cycle in our next discussion. Thanks, we'll see you next time.